joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Sing choirs of angels. Sing in exultation. Sing all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God. Oh, good morning. Uh, welcome to Arbor Heights Community Church. Uh, just want to let you know the reason we are not wearing a mask or taking our masks off this morning is uh, the service today is an online only service. And so we hope you join us next week, January 30th, as we come back to our in-person service here at the church. So this week, uh, jump online to our website and sign up and we'll be in person next Sunday. But today we're just online only. Hey, let's begin by doing a reading together. I know you're not here, but hopefully you can read at home. And I do want to say, I want to really encourage you, grab a Bible right now in your home. Uh, we're going to be doing different scriptures throughout the service this morning, so have a Bible handy that you can look through it with us and read along. So if you do, uh, flip open to Psalm 103 in your Bible, and we're going to do a reading together. And you'll see on the screen behind me the words. I'm going to go ahead and lead us in this, and then I'll take a second, and hopefully you can read along at home. This is Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. 
the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. God, I'm so touched in this reading that you said that we don't get what we deserve, and instead, your son took that. Lord, what a humbling thing to hear that you understand our weakness. You recognize we are made from the dust. We are weak people, broken people. And I thank you, Lord, that you have compassion and understanding on us, Lord. And I thank you that you died in our place, the very things that we deserve. You took them upon your own back. And we love you, Lord, and we give you praise and thanks for that this morning in your name. Amen. Hey, uh, I'm not sure if you realized it today, but today is the last Sunday of 2020. Yes, we made it. We made it. We made it. Uh, I heard a funny thing this week. Uh, someone had a, out on the internet, they said, uh, rather than wishing people Happy New Year, we should probably say, finally, a new year. I thought that was pretty uh, apt, given the year we've had. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm sure all of us are so looking forward to 2021, hoping things look very different than 2020. But I do want to say at the same thing, I do want to remind us, I actually want to give God praise for 2020. I know how weird that sounds and strange that sounds, but I think it's good for us to remember that Every single day is a gift from God. Whether it's a day that's full of struggle and pain or a day that's full of joy, every day is a gift. So in reality, 2020 was a gift from God. And so I actually praise Him for that, and I think we should too as a church. I also praise God because of what He's going to do in us and through us because of 2020. This has been a hard year, but if you're like me, I look back on the hard times in my life, and that's when God's done His best work. Amen? Amen. So I'm praying in 2021 that we see the fruit of all God's been doing in our hearts and through our church. And so I'm excited for what he has in store for us. Hey, um, I want to welcome up uh, Leah this morning. Uh, she's going to give us some announcements as we get started. Good morning. Um, hopefully, you saw the at-home bulletin that came out over email yesterday. If not, I encourage you to take a look at that. A couple of things I'm going to point out specifically. First, uh, for your calendar in 2021, it would be our first all-church prayer night. And so that is going to be January 12th at 645. We're going to meet here in the building down in Fellowship Hall. However, if you feel more comfortable joining us over Zoom, there is a Zoom meeting ID in the at-home bulletin. I encourage you to find that so that you can join us. Uh, second, starting on January 10th, so not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, 
uh, kids programming will start up again on Sunday morning here at church. And so if you have been worshiping at home um, with your family but would like to return and, and need something for your kids to do, I uh, encourage you to sign up when for January 2nd. We'll have a separate sign up for, for kids um, as they'll be downstairs in a separate space for the duration of the service. And so um, I'll be sending out an email with instructions for families on how the comings and the goings on those Sundays are going to work. Uh, but I encourage you to pray about that if that is something that you would um, like your kids to participate in. Um, and it's for kids who are fifth grade to, down to pre-K. And so um, looking really forward to that. been missing the, the kids. Uh, lastly, um, actually I have two more announcements, but the second kid family announcement is with a new month comes a new country of the month. So we took a break in December to uh, celebrate Advent, but in January we will return to the Inca Link activities of the country of the month. And this month of January we are going to do Costa Rica. Um, if you were a part of our church a while back, actually in January, it's going to be six years ago, we actually had a team that went down to Costa Rica. Um, and so anyway, we have some fun facts, some activities, some crafts, some um, recipes of different things that you can try. And so I'll send this out over email to the church, uh, but printed copies, because it's 26 pages, are available here at church. Or I can do a porch drop for you if that is something that would be helpful to you to learn more about Costa Rica. And lastly, before we move on, um, I just, uh, as a representative of the staff, would like to thank the church uh, for their very generous uh, Christmas gift uh, to the staff. We are so blessed and honored to be serving you um, and being alongside you through this crazy year of 2020. And so we just wanted to make a public thank you um, to all of you that participated in that. And so I would like to say a prayer this morning for our last offering of 2020. Will you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, what a year it has been. Um, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for your care of us through this year. Lord, your provision for our church through this year, Lord. Um, and just the generous heart that our congregation has for the church body and for the community and for missions around the world, Lord. Um, through us, you have just blessed and done mighty things this last year, Lord, and we thank you for including us in your work, Lord. And as we anxiously look for, forward to 2021, Lord, we just pray that our hands will be open, our hearts will be soft um, to do the work that you have to do through this year for us. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. I'm going to pass it back to John. All right. Well, uh, today is our last week of doing Advent, and I have to just say, uh, this has been such a special thing, uh, I, hopefully for us as a church, but I know for me just personally, it's the first time I've actually done this before. I uh, talked to a lot of people who've done it before, but never done it uh, my own self, and so I've really enjoyed as we started this a month ago as a church to do this. And so I hope you've been blessed by it too. I want to say a thank you too for the families that have been involved. I think it's been really cool to see families come up and take, take part in it. And so thank you for doing that. Uh, what I want to do today is actually just kind of start back at the beginning and go over each uh, candle as we light each one and then uh, lead up to our last one. And so let me do that. The first one we did, if you remember, was the candle of joy. That was our very first Sunday. And so I'm going to light that one right here. Uh, Sorry, John, it's the candle of hope. Of hope, excuse me. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> candle of hope. I got those mixed up. <laughs> yes, our candle of hope. And so we, that was our very first one. The candle, number two, is a candle of preparation. And I'll light that one right here as we prepare for the advent or the coming of Christ. Uh, the third one is the candle of joy, as Matt said. And so I'll light that one over here. And then we, uh, full disclosure, did go out of order. Um, if you watched our Christmas Eve service, our pre-recorded service, we did the Christ candle then in that, um, in that video. And so that's the one right here. So I'm going to light this one. We talked about focusing on Christ coming uh, to redeem us and save us and be with us. And so today, the last one is, is the candle of love. And so let me read to you a description of the candle of love. The meaning of the fourth candle, Advent candle, is love. The candle of love reminds us of the great divine love of God 
and the very reason for the coming of Jesus into the world. Our culture often promotes other kinds of love, but the love of God is a self-giving, self-sacrificing love for others. We give gifts at Christmas to one another in remembrance of the greatest gift, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, given by God to all on that first Christmas long ago. If you have a Bible with you again handy at home, I'll flip open to probably the most famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3.16. We're going to read John 3.16 through 18, and if you have it with you, uh, you can read it with me together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Let's go ahead and pray together. Lord God, I want to begin by just confessing, Lord, that our love and my love, I know, falls so short of the love that you have for us. The truth is, Lord God, that oftentimes our love is mixed with selfish motives or we love ourselves more than our neighbor, Lord God. And so this morning, we just confess that. We know the reason you came at Christmas was to die for us, Lord, to die for these very things, Lord, the ways that we don't love right. And Lord God, so we just thank you for that. We thank for your incredible cross-centered love that came and took our sin and bore it on your back, the penalty for our sin, the punishment, Lord God, and died in our place. And Lord God, I, I say, or I pray as you tell us in Romans 5 that you would pour out your love into our hearts by your Holy Spirit. The love that we don't possess, you would put inside of us. And Lord God, that we would go out to our families and our coworkers, our neighbors and friends, Lord God, with this sacrificial love, Lord God, loving them above ourselves. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have loved us in this way. And I pray your love is made real and made powerful. I pray the invisible love of Christ is made visible in our lives today and each day thereafter. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We do this in your precious and holy name. Amen.
chain shall he break for the slave is a brother and in his name all oppression shall cease sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all a short Christmas video about the incarnation and what that meant for God to become man and take on flesh, our Emmanuel, God with us. is real. And as we think about these candles and the candle of hope and the preparation we make in our hearts, 
the joy we have with the coming of Jesus, the love that God gave to us through Christ, it's in this season we can rejoice and thank God for his wonderful plan of salvation. Ken, would you come? He's going to read for us the story of Jesus' birth from Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this Thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I'm the squalor of a borrowed stable by the spirit of a virgin's faith to the anguish and the shame of scandal came the savior of the human race but the skies were filled with the praise of heaven shepherds listen as the angels tell of the gift of god come down to man at the dawning of servant in the Father's house, filled with power and the Holy Spirit, filled with mercy for the broken man. Yes, he walked my road and he felt my pain, joys and sorrows that I know so well. Righteous steps give me hope again. I will follow my Emmanuel. Through the kisses of a friend's betrayal, he was lifted on a cruel cross. He was punished for the world's transgressions. He was suffering to save the lost. He fights for breath. He fights for greed. Loosing sinners from the claims of hell. And with a shout, our souls are free. Death defeated. 
created by Emmanuel. Now he's standing in the place of honor, crowned with glory on the highest throne, interceding for his own beloved. Till his father calls to bring them home. Then the skies will part as the trumpet sound. Hope of heaven or the fear of hell. And the bride will run to her lover's arms. Giving glory to to her lover's arms, giving glory to Emmanuel. If you have your Bible again with you, you can open up to Isaiah chapter 61. There we go, the mic's on. Uh, if you have your Bible with us, you can open up this morning at your home there to Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, we're going to read verses uh, 10 through chapter 62, verse 3. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are reminded this morning that all hope, all satisfaction, all joy is found in you and you alone. You are a God of righteousness. You are a God of justice. We put you on display, Lord God. And I love the fact this talks about you, God, showing off, putting on this display of an incredible righteousness and glory, Lord God. And you are so good, and I pray that, Lord, every breath in our mouth, every word on our tongue, every thought in our mind, Lord, longs to glorify you and longs to make you most, uh, make you the greatest in all our lives and in all our entire world, Lord God. I long for the day when you return, Lord God, and every knee bows down and claims the name of Jesus Christ above all names, Lord God. You are absolutely worth it. Lord Jesus, I want to pray right now for our message. I want to pray for Matt as he brings uh, the word this morning, Lord God. I, I pray that you would use the words he speaks, Lord God, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to challenge us, Lord God, as we think about what it looks like to wait as Christians on you. I pray for boldness from Matt, for courage, Lord God. I pray for clarity. I pray for his words to be just anointed with your power as he speaks to us this morning, Lord God. And you would soften our hearts, Lord God, so we can hear what you have to say to us and we can uh, work, or we can grow in our waiting for you, Lord God. We can become people that look more like you each and every day. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor John. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share God's word with each of you this morning. And uh, it's a great day to kind of do two things. One, you know, looking back, here we are December 27th, a couple days after Christmas, 
but um, maybe some of us are still in the midst of things going on. A lot of us probably still have the decor up and the different uh, nativity scenes and decorations, and we're still in kind of that Christmas spirit and the Advent season. Uh, and yet, we're also looking forward. We're looking forward to the new year, hoping and praying that 2021 is much better than 2020. Um, you know, we'll see. Uh, so it's, we're kind of in that position of looking behind and looking forward, and, and those are both good things. But we get to look at a piece of scripture that that uh, is done precisely. It's like it's made for this part of the Advent season, and that is... Uh, picking up right where Ken left off reading in the book of Luke. Uh, now, the sermon today is, actually, let's go ahead and bring up our, oh, there we go. I, I think uh, we'll just do a couple quick reminders before I, I jump into the sermon here, as I see the slides behind me are reminding us of these things. And these are really telling us about looking ahead and, and things we're doing as a community that we want to invite everybody into. Uh, so first, we'll be looking January 6th, starting a new series called Issachar's Descendants, and that refers to the people of Issachar who understood the times and knew what to do and what God was saying to them to do, and I think we need a little bit of that in our church today, given the times. Uh, secondly, uh, 40 days of prayer, and so an email went out, maybe multiple, that where it's um, an invitation to all of us to register for this uh, project. I don't know about you, I need more prayer in my life. And something like this gives us a structure to build around to increase the prayer that each of us uh, does, is, lives. And as a community, we're praying about the same things together. And that's really powerful, I think. Does our world need more prayer our city, our state, our nation, yes. So I encourage you to find that email. If you don't have that email or you have an inbox with 10,000 items and you can't find the email, uh, send it, where would we go? Info at arborheights.org. Uh, info at arborheights.org and we can get you that link so you can get those notices and pray each day for 40 days with us all. Uh, next, this is the only place I can see it here, uh, ignite God's power in God's people. This is the new sermon series. So clarify for me, John, we saw Issachar's descendants, and I said that was a new sermon series, but this is the new sermon series starting January 3rd. What is the Issachar's descendants here? Uh, weekly, I'll be putting up a weekly video. So every week, John will be posting a video on YouTube and sharing that out to all of us, is that correct, with the theme Issachar's descendants. And so it's another opportunity for us to dig in the Word and see what's going on. But this will be our sermon series. Will they kind of maybe fit together and with the prayer thing? Or are these all totally... It'll all be connected. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. So uh, God's power in God's people. I know I need God's power in my life to live as God's person in this time and place. And so that'll be the focus of the sermon series. All right. Have we made it to our message yet? We have. Tremors, rumblings, and thunder. And our Christmas series uh, this year has, has really tried to look at, you know, this thing, this Advent season as a whole. And one of the things we'll see in some of the scriptures we look at today is that God was setting this up way beforehand. It's hard to put our place, our minds, and ourselves in the place of people who lived in a community for generation after generation after generation, after generation, hoping and praying for God's Messiah. We get to look back and see the whole story all together. And yet, just the prophecies in Isaiah were 700 years before Jesus. Not to mention, we're, we're going to look at stuff in Exodus and Numbers. I mean, we're talking a couple thousand years before the birth of Jesus. And God was doing it all. So, so clever and powerful. So, that's our sermon series uh, today. We're going to be talking about the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And that's not a phrase you hear very often, right? The apocalypse of Jesus Christ. When I hear the word apocalypse, I'm thinking zombie apocalypse, right? Like the virus has mutated a lot and zombies are now coming back from the dead and we've got to fight them off and get away. But um, in the Bible, the apocalypse uh, maybe 
that would you say, okay, what about the apocalypse in the Bible? Maybe the book of Revelation comes to mind. And the word revelation is the Greek word apocalypse. All right. So let's read just the first couple of verses of the book of Revelation just to kind of frame this thing for us here. And so this is Revelation chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. And I think we have just a key verse here. Uh, the revelation apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, Jesus Christ, to show his servants, us, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. I love that. So the book of Revelation is really the revelation of Jesus Christ. John is just the messenger. Now, we're, we're not going to spend more time in the book of Revelation, but our core passage today, Luke chapter 2, picking up right where Ken left off in the story of Jesus' birth, is the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when we look at the word apocalypse, change it to the next one. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing on the screen out here what I'm seeing back here, and so I need to kind of look back a little bit. Uh, the word apocalypse in Greece is the word, in Greek, <laughs> is the word revelation or to reveal or to unveil to uncover. And it's a major theme in this section of Scripture, and so we'll see it used multiple times. But you can imagine if I took a blanket and just threw the blanket over this altar and all the candles here, what would happen to those candles? They would, they would go out, right? They would lose oxygen and be, be snuffed. Leah's crossing her fingers. Maybe the, the blanket would go up in fire. Is that what you're thinking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but either way, they would be covered and so the apocalypse of Jesus Christ that we're going to read about in this scripture is like God pulling the cover off of his master plan that's been revealed all this time, but covered and hidden all this time. So we've used the words like Advent and Emmanuel throughout this season. And a lot of times we say, you know, Advent, these are the Advent candles. And we've mentioned a couple times what it means it's the, the Latin word to come to, or Advent. And when we sing about Jesus as our Emmanuel, that is God with us. And so this uncovering or unveiling is really the process of God coming to us. And the Advent season is looking forward to the coming of Jesus. So as we get into this, we're going to look at the first Advent, the first coming of Jesus that people were so hopeful and looking forward to. And yet, in our minds, we have to frame ourselves in an Advent season also, don't we? We are in an expectant waiting season for the second Advent, the second coming of Christ that the book of Revelation talks about too. So let's read in Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to start on... Uh, verse 21, and I don't think we have all the words. Go ahead and flip it for me, Mr. Nolan. Okay, hold there. We'll get to Exodus in a moment, um, but let's read through our primary scripture. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, so this is Jesus, the eighth day after birth, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived, and when time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. 
It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you can now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him, and then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So we have kind of this narrative, right, following the birth of Jesus until the family returns to Nazareth. That's kind of the frame of what we're looking at here. But it's very interesting that we start off with all this talk about the law of Moses, the law of the Lord. There purification. What does this mean? Why were they doing this? Why did Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple? Did it matter? They had gone down to Bethlehem, the city of David, because of the census, and now they were going to go back to Nazareth. Why not just go back a few days or weeks after? Well, we know in verse 21 that eight days later they would circumcise Jesus as was required by the law. Now, were you and I required to be circumcised in the new covenant? No. Paul says circumcision is nothing, whether you have it or not. What matters is the circumcision of your heart. Okay? So, Jesus, though, as we'll see, and Mary and Joseph are actually fulfilling every part that the law of the Lord requires. And so, they didn't just cast aside the law and the prophets, the law of Moses, but fulfilled every part of it and established the new covenant of grace that we live by now. And so the law of Moses, we can look back uh, here to Exodus. Now I'll finally get to, oh, wow, you went back. Good job, Nolan. To Exodus 13. And we're going to talk really quickly about why they took Jesus to the temple and did this whole consecration ritual When did they do it? Well, it wasn't after the eighth day. It was somewhere after, nearly after, 40 days after birth. And that's just because, uh, I think it's Leviticus 12, if you want to do your own study, um, a woman having a son as a firstborn would wait that period, about 40 days, and then go to the temple for purification rites. And so in verse 22, when the time of their purification was um, completed, That's when they took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, why would Jesus need need to be presented to the Lord? He is the Lord, right? Um, And yet, he's fulfilling the law. So let's read in Exodus. And I'm going to read verses 11 through 16. And so this is just after the nation of Israel has been delivered out of Israel and You know, think of that deliverance process. We have all of the the ten plagues and miracles that God did that refer to all these different false gods of the people of Israel. What was the last one that was most horrific? It was the the death of the firstborn, the death of the firstborn. Uh, But if you followed God's instructions to have a lamb, a paschal lamb, sacrificed it, put the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, What happened to your son? It was spared. It was spared. 
And so let's read Exodus chapter 13, verses 11 through 16. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, as he promised on oath to your forefathers, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Was it just the humans that got taken by the angel of death? And No, it was the livestock too. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. And so there's a sacrifice of the lamb. So you can keep the donkey and make your living and use these livestock to make your living, but you have a sacrificial lamb to redeem them. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. So you either do this or you, you don't get that. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. So what's being put in place all the way back is this idea of a redeeming sacrifice of a lamb. In the days to come, verse 14, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And I'll keep reading here. When the Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed every firstborn in Egypt, both man and animal. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. So this process of either sacrificing for a firstborn animal or consecrating to the Lord, redeeming every firstborn son, is something that goes all the way back to God bringing his people out of Israel and establishing the nation of Israel as his chosen people. And so this is a command in the law of Moses that Jesus Joseph, Mary, that they are fulfilling in this way. We have another passage related to this that helps us make a little sense as well in Numbers. Numbers 3, 11 through 14. Because what we have going on when they bring them to the temple is not just probably a sacrifice. They do, as it says in verse 23, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. That's this presentation and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Uh, so that was the process of doing this. Now, the, the pair of doves or two young pigeons, uh, it mentions that instead of the lamb because that was what was okay for a poor family to give as a sacrifice. So not everybody could afford a lamb, and so God made a concession that you could do this. So either that had just become normal for everybody because it was maybe cheaper, or... Maybe this was a really poor family that did not have a lot of means, and yet they were doing what uh, God required. But in Numbers 3, verses 11 through 14, let's see what you get to see. I have taken the Levites, a key verse there. Uh, I'm going to read verse 11. The Lord also said to Moses, this is later as they're entering Canaan, I have taken the Levites from among the Israelites in place of the first male offspring of every Israelite woman. The Levites are mine, for all the firstborn are mine. When I struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, I set apart for myself every firstborn in Israel, whether man or animal. They are mine. I am the Lord. And so this consecration happened where each firstborn was presented, and when we say consecration, made, designated as holy, um, committed to God's use and purposes. The animals, a sacrifice would be given. But the sons, it was something different. Did God want the sons sacrificed or their necks broken? No. If you read on in Numbers 3, and we're not going to do that right now, uh, excuse me, I think it's a little bit later, Numbers 11 and Numbers 12, what we see is that the process of God taking the Levites in place of the firstborn sons to serve him in the temple and as priests and the worship leaders was done with a ransom. It was five shekels of silver. A ransom was given, and it was not that, some, you know, that this thing was the value of somebody, but rather as a commemoration to, in fact, recall that Yes, God had done this in Egypt, 
that this exchange had been made for Levites and firstborn sons. And uh, we're going to bring each firstborn son to the temple, designate them as holy, as set apart for God's purposes and mission. And then, well, it became just like a temple tax or a fee. But paying five shekels means instead of the firstborn son serving God all his life in the temple, a Levite is going to do that on his behalf. And this ransom will designate that exchange. So fascinating stuff going all the way back in the Bible that is being referenced here in Luke chapter 2. When the time of their purification, 40 days-ish, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Was there any other place they could go? At that time, no. Think of all the world at this time. What is the one place that is the most holy place in all the world? It was the temple in Jerusalem. That's what it was. And so we'll read kind of in these different places that in the sight of all nations this happens. Jesus is revealed. God unveils him. The apocalypse of Jesus happens in the most holy public place, the most sacred place in all the world. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. Let's go ahead and move us along, Nolan. Thank you, sir. I want to focus on this key verse. We'll come back to Simeon in just a minute, but if we move ahead to verse 32, we read this. Uh, from 30, from my eyes have seen your salvation, this is Simeon prophesying, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. That's that reference to the temple in Jerusalem. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Why was this such a revelation? Why was this such a big thing? And I think for us, we look back and say, yes, Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. Okay. But for them, generation after generation after generation, Israel was God's chosen people, his people. And they were looking for a Messiah for the nation of Israel. That's how it was framed and how it was uh, read all through the law and the prophets. And yet Isaiah 42, as we'll look excuse me, 49, as we'll read in a minute, talks about that this is actually too small of a thing for Jesus just to save the nation of Israel. He's going to make him a light for everybody to the very ends of the earth. Thank God, right? But this man, Simeon, was, back to 25, righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit See you at that word revealed again? That he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. If something's revealed to you, you now see it. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. So this revelation was something personal for Simeon and something public for everybody. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. Nolan, go ahead and click me forward if you would. So a few things about Jesus that we gather from this portion. Number one, he is designated as holy. And that's a really important point because The word Messiah means something really specific. It means the anointed one, the anointed one. And as we look through all of Scripture, we have different people being anointed. Who are the anointed ones? We have priests being anointed, maybe articles of worship in the temple. Being anointed was a symbol of being set apart for God's use, right? And what was anointing? It was taking a a flask of sacred oil that was, you know, made clear, probably Leviticus, right, the the recipe, and pouring it over the head of the anointed person. And so that's how a priest was consecrated. And then 
also prophets were anointed. Prophets were anointed like Elijah and Elisha for God's special use. Judges were anointed. What about kings? The prophet Samuel, when finally a, a king was selected, whether Saul, or David, or others, would anoint that king to say this person is designated as holy, not just like moral perfection, but being set apart for God's use, anointed for God's use. And so Jesus was consecrated, and we read and went through that already. Click. Jesus is, in our key verse, the salvation of God, the light for revelation to all in the glory of Israel. We don't talk about sin a lot in our culture. It's not popular. It makes people maybe feel guilty. But we all need a Savior. We need salvation. So once you start to look at this idea of sin and see that it's anything that falls short of God's glory, God's perfection, and that I have to compare myself to God, all of a sudden I see, whoa, whether I feel one way or not, I'm a sinner. <laughs> and the wages of sin are death. I need that paschal lamb, that sacrifice, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of my heart because I'm a sinner. So what is God's salvation? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's revealed here as the salvation of God. And not just for his people Israel. Yes, he's their glory. He's the fulfillment of everything God was doing through the nation of Israel. But he's a light for revelation, apocalypse, for all the world, for you and for me, for Gentiles to come to God. That's awesome. I love that. And that's the peak of this passage of this prophecy from Simeon. Who is the Messiah? Jesus is the Messiah. And what does it mean? That's what it means. Let's go ahead and click forward. Jesus also, just said it, is the Lord's Messiah. You might notice in some of our scriptures that we have the word Lord in all caps. Have you ever noticed that? And that's because it's the specific use of the, what's it called? The tetragrammaton, the, the Y-H-W-H in Hebrew where the scribes were so careful to give God honor and respect that they wouldn't actually write his name. They wouldn't say it either. And so we, when we translate that into English, might use all capitals. This was God's Messiah. Jesus is the salvation of God that he's sending. But we're seeing Jesus presented here by reference in these prophecies as not just Messiah writ large, but the priest in the Aaronic line, because he was consecrated as holy. As a prophet in the line of, line of Samuel, who was another son brought to the temple, firstborn son, consecrated to full-time service in God, called by God, anointed as a prophet and as a judge? It was Samuel. Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophetic line. Also, Jesus, as we read, was of the house of David. And the fulfillment of the Davidic promise, the king whose uh, kingdom will never end, is Jesus. So in all these ways, he's the Messiah. Go ahead and move us forward here. So we have these ideas before us. We know that we are living in in hopeful expectation of the second coming, the advent of Jesus? How should we live with all this? And now we're going to go back to verse 25 and look at a few examples for us. Simeon, Anna, and then Jesus as well. By the way, it's worth noting as we kind of jump into this that Luke is rather famous in his books of Luke and Acts for giving us examples of both men and women. And I wish we had a little more of what Anna says here, but these are both prophets. These are both people led by the Spirit of God 
prophesying over Jesus and designated to be witnesses of the Messiahship of Jesus in the temple of Jerusalem. God uses men and women in this way. There was a man in Jerusalem, verse 25, called Simeon. And what was he like when he was waiting for the advent of Jesus? He was righteous and devout. Righteous meaning standing in right relationship with God. Am I the ruler of my own life or am I in humble submission to the God of the universe? He was devout. Did he keep the law of Moses at that time? Yeah, that's part of what it meant to be devout. We're not under the law of Moses now, but under the new covenant of grace in Christ. And so what is our calling? To love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love our neighbor as ourself. And yes, on those two things, the entire law and prophets hang. All these little rules and regulations hang on those. And so those principles still apply to us. So he was righteous, he was devout. What else was Simeon reading on? He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And this is said about Anna too, but it's just a slightly different wording. They're meant to parallel the redemption of Jerusalem. The consolation of Israel, the redemption of Jerusalem. This is a nation that had, you know, a glorious past of kingship that spanned the entire area. They were a dominant player in world affairs under the kingship of David and Solomon. And yet, they'd been divided into the north and south. They'd been ransacked multiple times, brought into exile. God had sent people back. And they thought they were building up again. And in 63 BC, the Roman army comes through and just wipes them out. The time before that, they had a big rebellions of many kinds, the Maccabean revolt where they had reinstituted temple sacrifices. And that's that they thought they were coming back into prominence with the Mosaic system. And they got wiped out again. And so they had read about the greatness of the nation Israel. And they were waiting for the Messiah of God to come and make them great again. But it was in this hopeful expectation, this positive mindset of waiting and trusting in God's promises. Simeon also, in verse 26, it says that the Holy Spirit was upon him. He was being led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided him to the temple that day. He had had some kind of promise, some revelation at some point. We don't know if it was a day before, a year before decades before. We know he was an old man and he was basically living for this one last thing, this fulfillment of this promise from the Spirit of God. This book is full of promises for us. This is God's Word. And the Holy Spirit that wrote this Word, that pulled it together, that intends it for each one of us, is the same Holy Spirit that gave that Word, that promise, to Simeon. And the same Holy Spirit that led him to the temple. And we too are to be led by the Holy Spirit. When you're saved, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And we need to look to God, to his Spirit's guidance in our lives. So that we too can live in the same kind of hopeful expectation and guidance as Simeon had. So he was moved by the Spirit to go to the temple courts. He approaches the child of Jesus, and then in verse 28, he praised God, and he utters this prophecy. Now, the words of his prophecy are from multiple chapters in Isaiah. We have these four, what are called uh, servant prophecies, or songs of the servant. And the references uh, are many. I'm just going to read a piece of one that this comes from, and then we'll read the prophecy again. So, from Isaiah chapter 49. I'll read rather quickly. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword in the shadow of his hand. He hid me. This is the me here is talking about the Messiah. This is prophetic. And who is it? God has hid his Messiah, okay? In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. And so we have this language of the hiding 
that God was doing of the Messiah in this plan. He said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will display my splendor. But I have said, I labored to no purpose. I've spent my strength in vain for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand and my reward is with my God. But now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. He says, this is God's word, it is too small a thing for you, the Messiah, to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I've kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And the prophecy of Simeon, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. I love it. Simeon is steeped in the prophecies in Messiah. And so as the Holy Spirit moves him, that's what's coming to his mind. So, if we steep ourselves in hip-hop culture, in Instagram, in Facebook, in soap operas, in sports, whatever we're filling our mind with, that's the kind of resources we have, that's the kind of soil something can grow in, that's the kind of thing that's going to come out. But if we're led by the Spirit and we're filling our minds and hearts and souls with the Word of God, that's the kind of things we have to bring, the things we have to speak. And then now that can be the Word of God into other people's lives. So this prophecy of Simeon was a combination of the Spirit's words and moving and his resources and upbringing the Spirit had prepared him with to utter just the right thing at the right time. And that's to God's glory. He works with us and through us. You know, these prophecies we read about in the Bible, sometimes we picture them like somebody goes into a trance and just utters something. They don't know what they said, and it's like, you know, Professor Trelawney in like Harry Potter. But that's not what we read about. That's not how the prophets operate in the Bible. Rather, they're conscious. Their minds are full, okay? When, you, when we're being taught these days to like empty our minds and to meditate, to empty ourselves, that might be calming, but that's not the example we get. We are to fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit to have the mind of Christ. I don't have the study off the top of my head, but for anybody thinking about the benefits of meditation and emptying yourself and mindfulness, uh, there is a study that shows that prayer provides the exact same health benefits. So if you want those health benefits, don't do new age practices. Pray. Maybe for 40 days at the start of, Israel, uh, of the new year. Sorry, an aside. I would say I digress, but I think I progress because that was probably, you know, very beneficial, at least for me. Uh, so we have this prophecy that's a combination of Simeon and his experiences and the Holy Spirit's movement. And now let's look at Anna, who also is an example in the faith. Do you know the name Anna is just the Greek version of Hannah? So if we look back, if you want to really like dig in here, the song of Hannah in the first part of 1 Samuel is a prophecy that correlates almost perfectly to Mary's Magnificat, which is in the chapter before in Luke. We're not going to read through all these, but that prophecy, when she gives Samuel to the Lord in the temple, Hannah's prophecy ends talking about the anointed of the Lord. So it starts with her talking about Samuel and how she's bringing it, and it's a fulfillment of God's promise to her, and it ends with her praising God for the strength of his anointed one that will come and save the nation. It's incredible. you got to check it out. I believe it's 1 Samuel 2, maybe 1 through 10. But Anna, or Hannah, 
was married, her husband dies, and then is a widow, and at this time she's 84, and what a statement. She never left the temple, I'm in verse 37, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Oh my goodness, this is the kind of thing you look at and go, are you sure that's like an example I'm supposed to do because, you know, an hour at church on Sunday, like, you know, I'm trying to keep awake. No, I'm just kidding. Um, But people used to go to church a lot more, right? Used to be Sunday nights and Wednesdays. Uh, Hannah, Anna was dedicated. She never left the temple, it says, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Was she fasting? She probably ate. Okay, but she probably fasted a lot and prayed a lot. If we're doing those things, we're in the house of God, we're with God's people, that doesn't mean just coming to the building, right? But we're in fellowship with God's people for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, the Lord says. That might be in a small group. That might be getting together with another person in prayer and certainly coming together as a congregation in church. We're going to fill ourselves with the Word of God, with the Spirit of God as we're together. Fasting and praying, these are spiritual disciplines. We don't talk about that word a lot either, spiritual disciplines. They're difficult. They're hard. When I pray, I only last so long. And then I, all of a sudden I go, wow, I've just been thinking about such and such for like 10 minutes. It's like a muscle, right? So let's start that year off with a prayer bodybuilding program. You want to lift some weights? Let's do the 40 days of prayer. Let's work out our prayer muscle. And maybe by the end of that, it'll be easier. We can do more reps. John, you like to... I can't lift anymore. I know, it's sad. I injure myself. This is what happens when you turn 40. If you don't think that's real, you haven't lived long enough, right? <laughs> All right, so uh, Anna is a wonderful example to us as well. She was in the temple night and day, worshiping constantly, praying, fasting. And she was also led and guided by the Holy Spirit, came up to them at that very moment. I think she utters a prophecy as well. We don't have it here. I would love to hear that. But it says she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. That redemption of Jerusalem is paired with the consolation of Israel. It's about God fulfilling his promises to them. And who are the people looking forward to that? These are Jewish people in the temple. And so, you know, Jesus here is just born. We have about 30, 32, 33 years until his public ministry, 30 years, and then he has the three years of public ministry. I think there's probably people responding at that time who heard the word spread by the shepherds, spread by Anna. She keeps talking. She's a witness of Jesus in that time. And that's what we're to be like, too, in our waiting of the second advent. At the temple, with others, in church, worshiping, fasting, praying, witnessing about who Jesus is and what he's done in me to all. And then with Jesus, go ahead to the next one. He was designated as holy to God. That's an example for us. Do we need to go to the temple and sacrifice something and pay five shekels? No, no, that is the law of Moses. But we are to be consecrated in our hearts to the Lord. Amen? Set aside as holy for God's use. He is the way of God's salvation, and we too are to be people who bring God's salvation to others. Should I cover my light? Should I hide it under a bushel? No! Just a little bit later in Luke chapter 3, the same word unveiled is used. And um, I didn't put it in the notes here. Gosh, and now I'm struggling to find it. Maybe it's Luke chapter 6. You're not supposed to do this when you preach. Okay. 
Okay, I'll move on. But I think it's in Luke chapter 6. The same word for apocalypse is used, and yet it's the opposite. It doesn't have the ah. It just has calypse, and it means to cover something. And uh, I believe it's Jesus talking about whether we should cover our light. And, um, boy, I should have had that reference ready. So I'll leave you on a hunt to search for that at some point. But the answer is no. We shouldn't collapse. We shouldn't cover the light God has given us, but instead be the way of salvation for others like Jesus is. Jesus was also a light to all people. This is not something that's selective anymore, right? And looking forward to God's advent. These are the examples we see in this passage. Go ahead, Nolan. I guess I'm supposed to end there. <laughs> well, I love it. This, this passage is something that's really special because, um, you know, I still have the Christmas season kind of ringing in my head. The songs are still with us. Well, maybe not. My son told me that he was uh, up kind of late on Christmas night, you know, couldn't sleep, and usually has music on and is listening to it, And so, of course, he's been listening to Christmas music to go to sleep since Thanksgiving, right? And he said at the stroke of midnight on Christmas, it switched back to regular music on the radio station. And so some people are really ready to move on. Maybe that's you. Maybe not. I still really like it. It feels really warm and homey. But I think the intention here of the Advent season is that it's not something we just move on. This is a reminder, a commemoration of the way we live, are to live all the time in an expectant hope that God will fulfill his promises to come to us in the person of Jesus, Emmanuel, and live God with us. It was true for the first Advent, and now we live like Simeon, like Anna, waiting for the second Advent. Will you close your eyes and pray with me? Father, you're so good and we love you so much. Not because we're anything good, but because you first loved us. Help us, God, in those parts of unbelief that we all have. Give us faith to have trust in you. For you're the one who's faithful. Help us to hold unswervingly to our faith in these difficult times. Maybe I have personal issues that are really difficult now. Maybe it's family. Maybe my job is in crisis. Maybe I'm feeling the weight of everything going on in our city, our state, our nation with the different groups of people and the different claims they want to make upon me. But you are our peace. You are our salvation. You are our light. Be our peace, Lord. Be our comfort. Be our light. We love you and thank you for this time and this word to us in this Advent season. Amen. Pastor John, if you would come. Uh, I guess I kind of did the closing prayer, but I'll invite you maybe to give us a benediction looking forward to the new year uh, as we move into 2021. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for giving us the word today. Uh, I was reminded in that, uh, as you were talking about all the different things that God had put in place through the centuries, uh, the, uh, you know, prophecies, the temple, all those things, that all this plan was all God and not us. Uh, that kept hitting you over and over, that this is all God. The whole entire thing is all Him and not us. And so I pray that's really a word for us in 2021 as well. Uh, we want to be a church that it is all God and not us. Amen. Uh, we want a place where we are so dependent on God that it's all about him, not about us, and we see him work through us in powerful ways. And I do really believe, as Matt said, one of the key ways is joining us on January 3rd for the 40 days of prayer. Um, that's going to be a time where we seek the Lord with all our hearts and really start off in the power of God. You know, I love it too with Anna and Simeon that what struck me so much as well is just how serious they took Jesus, uh, right? They were waiting year after year after year, and they were dedicated and committed and it made me think about myself, am I that committed to God? 
uh, would that be described of my faith, of my life with God? And so I pray that in 2021, maybe we, for us, it, it's, a, it's a recommitment to give God my all, to give God everything and who I am and trust Him and walk with Him in a devoted way in 2021. Um, as I said before, I do praise God for 2020. Uh, it's been a tough year. I, as much as you, I'm so looking forward to COVID to be over, hopefully, us to get back together, you know, with our whole church, all that to happen, and I pray that happens, but at the same time, I pray God uses this year in a powerful way to change us. I pray we look back and are thankful for what he did for the year ahead. So let me pray as we head out, and then Matt's going to have a, a, a song. Lord God, we love you. We give you praise, uh, Lord Jesus. Um, Lord, my heart does go out to those in 2020 who maybe some of us lost someone, maybe if it was a, a parent or a friend or a relative, Lord God, and, and our hearts just break for that, for that loss, Lord, of a person this year. Um, Lord God, so we just pray for that person uh, where they're at. We pray for their heart, Lord God. We pray that you would be the one who comforts them. Uh, Lord God, but we also just ask, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts for 2021. We are ready for a new year. We're ready for new things to be done, Lord God. May we just humbly uh, come and surrender ourselves today to you and lay our lives before you, lay our aspirations before you and our hopes, and know that you're going to do a good work in us. It may not be what we think. 2020 was nothing like we thought, but I'm so thankful it's not about our plans, but yours. And uh, may we follow your Holy Spirit as you lead us in 2021. In your precious, powerful, and unbelievable name, Jesus, we love you. Amen. God bless. Pray you have a wonderful day. Rejoice, rejoice, and sing with the angel voices. Rejoice, rejoice.